Divine Truth Name of this presentation is Reflections on the Way and it is part of Lessons in Love series. It was presented in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia on the 22nd of September 2012. Hello everyone. We're having a change of our program today. So I'm going to be talking to you guys for a little while. And um, Jesus is going to be on the microphone. <laughs> and after that, then we're going to have a bit of a concert with Kate and Fab and Jesus, I think. Is that right, guys? Yeah? Yeah. But before we do that, I just wanted to spend a bit of time talking with you about the way. This way that we always talk about. Uh, when we visit here and when we're travelling around the world. And I figure you guys know a little bit about it by now. Would you agree? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> well, that's really what I wanted to talk to you guys about today, is what is the way and are we actually living it? So I'd like to really have an interactional kind of a discussion with you. I'd like to involve you guys in it. Um, I was told that there are now 700 hours of watching on the Divine Truth channel. So who's watched a fair amount of what's on that channel? Yeah, that's 80% of you. So I reckon you could nearly run this discussion. <laughs> so let's see how we go, hey? Um, have we got, how many microphones have we got? Yep, we've got two. So Sarah and Jesus are going to be your mic runners. And I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions. So just raise your hand and wait till the mic gets to you and we can start our discussion. So my first question for you today is, what is, what is this way? What is the basis of the way? Go here. Love. Yeah, what a, let's try and be specific today. What about love? Yes, if you do that, I'll... Bring the ear. Is that it? Possibly finding more uh, divine love in our way. Yep, okay, and what does that mean? What does it mean, finding divine love? Let's be, if we go to Philippa. Uh, connecting to God, developing a relationship with God, because yep. that's the only place it comes from. Yep. Good. This is how specific I want to be. So we're going to have a relationship with God. And what is the motivation for that relationship? Why do we want it? So part of it is about love, I hear you saying. So receiving divine love... Is there any other thing we want from this relationship? If we just go behind Karina there. To... And divine truth. Divine truth. So God's truth as well. Why do we want God's truth? Uh, Karina? So we, can, so we can correct ourselves with our errors. Uh-huh. And why do we want to correct ourselves with our errors? Kate? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a path that leads to us being at one with God. Uh-huh. So we want to be at one with God. Why do we want to be at one with God? I mean, I agree, I'm agreeing with all these things, but really I want to get down to why you're doing this thing or why you're coming to all these talks. If we go to Joanne here, just next to you, babe. Yep. Um, because we want to grow in love and expand our souls so that we can be also more loving to others. Lovely, yep. So we can express love to others. Any, any other way we want to express love? If we go Teresa and then over here in the middle, Sarah. Yeah. Um, to realise our full potential or as much of it as we can. Yes, okay. Does anyone have any clue on what our full potential might look like? 
what might it be better in? What might it be? Uh, what might our full potential be like? Sis? To feel eternal joy. Joy, yeah. Everyone, joy. Yeah, what else? Laura? To be fully ourselves. Uh huh. So, so to express our personality? To express our personality, yep. the way that God created us and the way that God sees us expressing yep. that. Yep, okay. Uh, Eloisa? To find the other half of my soul? To find us. <laughs> find me. To find the full me, yeah, yeah, awesome, Pete. To feel God's love, like we talk about the relationship to God, but we want to actually be able to have this connection and this feeling with each other. With each other, yeah, yeah. At the back here. So God's love. Uh, I feel pretty much to remove pain from our existence. To remove pain, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that we live in this state of joy that Cecily was talking about, yeah. Okay, anyone else? Yvonne here, and yep, sorry, we missed you on... Um, you were talking about reaching our full potential. There's uh, so many other things, like as we gain more love, we'll gain more of God, all God's other attributes, so we'll be more creative, have more wisdom. Um, yep. So in other words, we'll be more of God's attributes in, in every way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lovely. Anything else? Y- yep. If we go Philippa and then pass behind you when you're done. To live in harmony with our environment and give love to the environment. Lovely. So we're not just expressing love to others but our environment. Yep. And if you just pass behind you, Philippa. So in helping us give a, get a... A wider view of um, was like God's truth, but we so that we're able to see the hope and the um, potentiality. I think what I'm saying is we can get an overview of uh, what God's plan is. So beautiful. Do you understand? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So we get to understand God's vision and desire for not just us but for the world. Beautiful. Okay. I want to. I want to. Uh, Write it all on one side, but so that's not really helpful, is it, if I do it sideways? <laughs> so we want to understand God's vision. So this is awesome, guys. This is some beautiful motivations for actually embracing this way, isn't it? How do you feel like it's going? How do you feel? Does anyone want to talk about how you feel? Like, who feels like they're, um, they're expressing more love to others and the environment? A few of you? Yeah? Yeah? How do you feel about joy, creativity and wisdom in your life? <laughs> it's coming. It's not here yet. <laughs> Eloisa? I feel like all this stuff like pulls me forward and in the moments when I'm not stuck in my own mire, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like um, often I get like pulled down in my own crap really and um, you know the addictions and the things that I want really badly and that I'm only just starting to even see those you know in the last little while. So it's sort of like these I know in like some natural love stuff you talk about, you know, where you are and then the higher where you want to get sort of pulled out of. And it's always reminding myself of these things, but I don't often feel I'm doing these things. It's like uh-huh. I'm trying to step into them or have a go at them or, um, yeah, I suppose explore them a bit. But I don't feel purely, even with desire, that I'm purely engaged in desire. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like this process and I, I don't feel... Yeah, you know, I want it now. Well, I don't because I'd have it. But, um, you know, <laughs> I think I want it now. <laughs> but yep. I quite like all the obvious dramas that I create. Yeah, yep, yep. Pete? I just want to add with that for myself, like I can't imagine going back, although it's not pretty and nice a lot of the time. 
I can't remember, can't, can't go back to where I was a few years ago. Like, I just, I can't comprehend that. Yeah. So you're in that middle, in the, in the grey zone at the moment or the, <laughs> the middle area. You're not one or the other. And, yeah. And that's just the area that I am at the moment. So you, f does everyone, does anyone else feel like that? Like, you're engaged in a process. Like, okay, something started, but I, I don't know how it's going or how, how I'm getting there, but I can't go back to how it was. Is that how a lot of you feel? Yeah, lots of nods. What I, I hope today we can just confront a few things with you guys that I can be really straight with you about some of the things that I see happening because I feel like a lot of you start with this beautiful aspirations, hey? This, I want to know God so I can love others and so I can understand myself and so we might even change the world. Like some of you, I feel, are drawn by that motivation. And then I see you engage in this process, you learn all this truth in your, in your minds, you start to engage it, and then I see lots of you feel bogged down, this doesn't feel, I don't know, oh, you know, how are you, oh, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question anymore, and <laughs> I, feel good. I've, I've feel, I feel good today, I'm guilty about feeling good, like, you know, and it, it sort of seems to get a bit, like, like a bit of a spiral that people enter, and in six months later I see them and I go, what's happening? Like, I feel like you've lost sight of these things, and you just feel blur, and you, you're trying hard to do it the right way, but you don't know, and it's all in your head, and it, it, I just feel like it would be good if we really talk about the nuts and bolts of what's really going on, and why, why we're engaged in this process, and, and actually some of the things we're avoiding in this process. Does that sound okay? Yeah, yeah. all right. Okay. So. Given that we've all seen about 700 hours of lectures, we've got the basics, what, why we're doing it, what it's really about, okay? Now, how do we do it? How do we do it? What are the tools we've been told or the qualities we've been told we need to do these things? Hang on, I'll just wipe off. Yeah, it's pretty basic. All right, what are some of the things? Susan? Set. <laughs> it seems pretty basic, but in actual fact, I'm not finding it that way. <laughs> it's about being humble in every moment of every hour of every day, and I certainly find that quite challenging at times. Quite challenging. Well, yeah. more than challenging, I'm just not there. Yeah. 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 Okay, humility, definitely. That's the first key thing we know. Um, Catherine, behind you. Longing and desiring God's love and truth. Mm -hmm. Longing and desire. And we know that's about desiring God's truth, desiring God's love. What else is it about desiring? What else do we have to desire? Or, or perhaps we can be a bit more specific about God's truth. Just here, yeah. If you just wait for the mic, that's it. Uh, an openness, having an openness to receive. Yep. So our longing and desire will open us up, but what do we want the truth about? Ourselves. Yes. Yes. That's. You're saying it like it's obvious, but I'm saying to you guys. <laughs> On this side of the column, on this side of the board is where I write the things I actually see. I actually see happening. And one of the big things I see happening is resistance to feedback. And I wanted to talk to you guys about that because I see that happening a lot with Jesus. A lot of you, you go, oh, yes, yes, I want the truth, I want the truth, I want the way, this is awesome. He gives you feedback and you're like, I can't handle that, I'm afraid, I, you know, or I want to be angry about it, or uh, he's just got it wrong about me, he's right about everything else, but I know me. <laughs> now, how many of you have actually felt like that? A lot of you, yeah, yeah. Um, but the other side to this is between each other. What it means to be humble with each other and to allow God's 
truth about a situation to come to you from any means through the law of attraction. I see a lot of you struggling with remaining humble to yourselves as you give feedback to each other. A lot of you are really afraid to say what you actually feel, so you get rigid, and then you tell the person. <laughs> now, is that humble? It's not humble. Can it be loving? No. We're actually living in fear of walking this way, of just humbly sharing with each other what we see and what we feel. And then when you receive the feedback from someone who's a bit afraid about it and a bit rigid about it and they just blurt it out, how do you respond? <laughs> is it with humility or is it saying, well, shit, when Jesus tells me, that's okay because I can tell he loves me, but that person didn't, so I don't, even, I don't even know if they're right. I don't even have to listen to them. This happens like a lot. <laughs> And this is a big impediment to us. If we Remember the first lot of things we wrote up there, these beautiful aspirations. And we know there's actually only two things we need to do to get there. Be humble, long for God's truth and love. And yet we fall down really at the, at the starting blocks a lot of the time, don't we? As Susan said, it's pretty tricky in a world where, that trains us not to be humble, to turn that around... But we have to be real with ourselves about where we are at with all of that. Yeah. Can you guys see any other ways that you fall into resistance towards these two states? Right. Yeah, Karina? Denial. Denial, yep. Can you be more specific? We're about being specific today. You have to hold it. What? Oh my goodness, I can't believe that you're expecting him to follow your head with the microphone. How unloving is that? <laughs> um, well, denying that I need to do it for myself. Is the first <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, a feeling of this is what I wanted to raise with you guys. There's a lot about taking personal responsibility in humility and in longing and desire. If we really want to embrace humility, if we really want to embrace our desires, we have to take responsibility for them. Like, what is inside of me? I have to be responsible for that. And a lot of you I see in practicing humility get very self-involved, you know? Oh, I've got to feel my stuff and, you know, and it's, oh, it's a lot about the grief and with my dad and, you know, and then I... Then you go to talk to each other and all you're talking about, I, I look at you guys and all you're talking about is, yeah, I was, you know, I think I got close to the causal, but I'm really blocked around this thing. And, yeah, no. I, and neither of you is actually talking to each other. You're just talking at each other about the, this issue of trying to develop humility when in the actual interaction you're not being humble. You're just being self-involved and talking about emotion. This is one of the biggest pitfalls I see people fall into when they, when they hear about divine truth. They think, I've got to be humble because that's how it's all going to work. But then they, they don't stop to really receive what humility is in their heart, you know? And I'm guilty of this in the beginning as well. I realised, oh, that means feeling everything inside of me. I can see it like a distant train wreck that I'm going to have to visit. <laughs> I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I'll just stand here and talk about it for a while with you and, you know, ruminate about how horrifying it's going to be when I'm actually in the middle of it. <laughs> and that's living in fear, which is not humble. And I see, I, yeah, I just, I feel like if we can just grasp the real message of humility which is about being responsible and being connected to what's inside of us. And that, ironically, when you do that, you become connected to other people as well. When I see you guys living, like I look around at seminars and you're all there talking to each other, like lots of you I've known for four years and lots of you I know very, like a great deal about your life, how you grew up, where you live, you know, because I want to know you. But a lot of you don't know anything about each other. 
And this is an issue of not just humility, of being humble in the moment when you're with someone, but it's also about this desire to love that we talked about. If I, if I love you, I want to know you. That's how God feels about us. He wants to know us. He already knows us, but he wants us to engage in that process. And when I love a person, I really want to know them. We had an experience last weekend, a journalist sorry, came... Sorry, babe, can I interrupt? We would need to change your microphone because you're, you're the one who's buzzing. Oh, And it's okay. just interfering with everything, so sorry to interrupt. This so where was I? Oh, about the media, yeah. There was a journalist came from Sydney last weekend and he wanted to interview some of our followers... <laughs> and after we explained that we don't really consider any of you followers, <laughs> um, we did say there's some people who live locally and I'm sure they'd be happy to speak to you about their experiences. And so a, a group of about 10 got together and we weren't there. They met with the journalist and the journalist asked them lots of questions. But we met with them afterwards and they said, it was so great. I got to hear the story of all these people. I've known these people for three years and I never knew. I never knew what they did before they found divine truth. I never knew how they grew up. And I said, why didn't you? <laughs> why, why would you spend four years, almost every weekend, some of you guys hey, have spent in each other's company. And it's not to, know, not to get into the big story of everyone's life, but just naturally as you're communicating with each other, you do tend to share your life. You do tend to share what, what has brought you to this point. And um, I felt it was kind of sad that these 10 people who've known each other for such a long time didn't actually know each other. And I thought, we're missing something really big here about love. About love. Alexis? Um, there seems to be this emotion, though, uh, with people that I find get on this path where we either want to reject our past or we, we see it like, well, that's what just messed us up, so I don't want anything to do with it. You know, there's a bit of that when I try and, like, ask, pry into people's lives, you know. That or or if, if you're part of a natural love path, you're like, yeah, I'm this guilty sinner. I was part of a natural love path, you know. And there's a lot of, like, all sorts of wow. projections I wow. find that come out of just sharing the past. So. <laughs> Wow. So you find you find you encounter people's judgments of yeah, or you fear I was, their judgments. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, because I was heavily in the natural love stuff, and yeah, you know, I mean, I'm still fascinated by the science of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so you know, there's this part of me probably that that won't share. You know, the nature of say a mantra or something like that. Even though you know, like, not that I'm still engaged in it, but I find a fascinating element to it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That would be part of my past. Yeah. yeah. But it's part... Interestingly, when we're humble, yeah. we're going to have to revisit every part of our past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did sure. you not realise that? Like, you're going to have to be okay with everything that's happened in your past. You're going to have yeah. to be able to look back on all of your life, and once you've released everything from you, you'll be fine with every single memory. If you're not right now, it's showing you. There's something there unhealed inside of me. There's a fear or a grief that I haven't resolved. So visiting your yeah. past, at least personally, is, is very important, I feel, because emotions have led us into every, into every path that we've taken, haven't they? And we yeah. can learn a lot about ourselves and if we look backwards. Yeah. And I think perhaps, to be honest, we, we also kind of cherry-pick the past, you know, like, and if there's any sort of like, oh, well, that was an error type stuff here, you know, like, you hear that enough that you're like, oh, I don't think I'll ever mention that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just show them the <laughs> highlights. It's funny, I reckon I've shared with you guys the low lights of <laughs> everything I'm ashamed of or thing that... Yeah, so I'm guilty, too, of not being humble in that sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, think it's, I think it's about humility, but also a desire to love each other. You know, guys, I think... There's a lot, I brought along a whole list of statistics that I wanted to, um, to talk to you guys about because there's a lot that's going on in our world. There's, like, there's more slaves today that are, than in any other time in human history. There is um, almost half the world, over 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 $2 a day. 
And if you make $35,000 annually, you are in the top 4% of earners in the world. So there's a lot going on out there. There's a lot of hardship and poverty and injustice. And if we can't even love each other, <laughs> we have these, these amazing aspirations that we had at the beginning to be able to extend love to other people, I just feel if, if we're not embodying that here, how, is, how, how are we ever going to change the world? And we must be missing something vital about this teaching. Because you've all come to it and recognised in it, ah, this is something that I've been looking for. This is, I want to grow in love and I think this guy might be teaching something about it. And then we engage in this process and it's almost like suddenly we lose sight of everything, isn't it? Yeah. Laura? Um, my biggest impediment to the path would have to be that so much of my personality was based in error and to let go of a lot of addictions, I find it really hard to be humble and be myself and have a personality. I don't, I don't know my personality without that personality. So there's such a fear of rejection of who I'm going to be without that because that's now really me. So, yeah, for me it's very linked to criticism and rejection and it just it impedes all those beautiful things that, that I came into the path with. Can you see, though, Laura, that this is where we need to stop making excuses for ourselves in our fear? Like, I, I have total compassion for what you're saying because I feel like that's a lot of me as well. When I met, when I met Jesus again, I was like a little addiction factory, you know? And a lot of what I thought was me and what I was presenting to the world was actually a big facade. However... We know, because we have 700 hours on YouTube, that underneath our facade is a real personality that we don't have to manufacture, actually. We only have to let it be. And, and so it, it is about this... Humility is about confronting fear. And if we can't do it in this little group, how, how, how are we going to do it? And if we feel like... What concerns me sometimes is that it can feel scarier to be yourself in this setting than in another setting. Why is that? I honest, I'm asking you sincerely, I don't understand that. Teresa? I feel like I'm going to be judged a lot more here than in the outside world if I say things um, about myself. Yeah. So, so we're a group of people who supposedly have come together because we desire to grow in love both for ourselves and for other people, and yet now we feel we're going to be judged more here by those same people. Do other people feel that way? So a few of you, yeah. So what's going wrong? What is it that we're skipping? What is it that we're missing, Matthew? I think you might have mentioned it kind of recently that there's sort of become a bit of a divine love facade and it's like the divine love competition or yeah. something between a lot yeah. of people instead of actually really taking the teachings to heart. Yeah, and I suppose that's something that... It's, it is a bit of a theme for me at the moment because I, I really feel like, wow, this teaching is life-changing and it's humble. Like, humble, it comes from earth. <laughs> you know, it's, it's close to the earth, it's real, it's... It's not flowery, it's, it's not based in competition or facade. But I can see, and I can say with compassion, that when we come from a world that's very based in competition and facade, it's easy to be attracted to a teaching, but unless we want to be humble, to then transpose our feelings of competition and facade onto different terminology. And I see this happening. And this is why I want to talk to you guys about it. Because I know inside of your hearts you have all those beautiful aspirations we listed at the beginning. But we, we need to be conscious of, of how we're walking this path. Are we really walking it? Or are we just... Did we just honestly... Um, and this might be confrontational also, but honestly I feel like a lot of you have been drawn to this because you think this is awesome. 
I love this. It makes more sense than anything I've heard. And it, I feel like I've wanted to grow all my life and to be more loving and to understand the universe and to know God. And you've come to it and thought, yes, this is what I want. And then you've, heard, like, then you've been confronted with what humility really is. And at that point, there's a decision. Do I challenge my fear of this new state? Or do I just, like me, look at the train wreck off in the distance and now just talk about it? We'll all just talk about this issue and act like we can never... We're getting there, you know, we're getting there. But we'll never... It's, it's somewhere in the future. I don't feel humility is somewhere in the future. Perfection, yes. Humility is a moment-by-moment -moment decision that we can choose to make. And I feel that many of us, and I would include myself in this group until recently, have wanted, we've liked the idea, we've thought, yes, this is a wonderful aspiration, but we have not made the decision to commit to it in our life. Like, to make the decision to choose it, rather than saying commit, to choose it in our life. And because of that, guess how a cult forms? That's how a cult forms. When we all go, yeah, we all believe this one thing, but we, we want to hang together. We just want to belong here. We just want to talk to each other about the same kind of terminology at all. We'll hold, hold the same ideal, but we, we're afraid of everyone else and what they're going to think of us. We're afraid of actually stepping into the world in humility, stepping into these teachings everywhere that we are. So we'll just come together once every couple of weeks and talk about it and sort of try to embody it or we'll have a group and we'll, we'll do it that way. But we don't, we don't actually want anyone else to kind of challenge what's happening here. Do, can you relate to that? Like, I felt like that. I'm like, this is nice. I feel safe now with this whole, this whole identity thing has been freaking me out. But now I think I've kind of come to terms with it a little bit. And this group of people at least don't, like, you know, ridicule me for it. So we'll all just get together and talk about it. But can I tell you, like, the last two times that, we talk, that we've both been here speaking, I noticed there was two new people at the back of the room. They'd never been here before, and they didn't have any seats. And I waited for someone to see them and offer them a seat, and it didn't happen. And I thought, wow, what, can't, what, are, we, what are we doing here? We're afraid of these people. Instead of welcoming them in, we're afraid of them. And I feel it does start back... I've taken you down a bit of a road here, but I feel it all starts back with missing this idea of humility. What do you guys feel about all that? <laughs> Just here, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the commitment thing is a real big thing. Um, I'm just trying to put on some sort of analogy with it. If you could think of, well, say you've got to go to the dentist or something, you know he's the one that's going to fix the tooth. Yep. You've got the longing and desire to get the damn thing fixed, you know. I've <laughs> really got to do something about it. Yeah. So when you're going, oh, I'm not going to the dentist. No, bugger that. that that's, they, they, that's too hard. It yep. hurts. You know? yep. so the commitment thing, I think, should be on that left-hand side. You, unless you commit, everything else is a waste of time. In yeah. a way. Yeah. yeah. Sort of. But unless you actually decide that you will do what has to be done, then it's not going to work. Well, then it's not even happening yet, is it? No, no. So not. can we say rather than commit, because that, I don't know, I, I use that word sometimes, and Jesus goes, yeah, commit, bad word, because it implies maybe other things, but choose. Cho if we choose this. For a long time, I feel we've been talking about this, but are we choosing this? It's like going to the dentist. You know, are we actually making the appointment or are we in the chair? <laughs> yeah. Or are we trying to, like, are we making a choice to have best dental health so we never even have to get to the dentist? <laughs> yeah. 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 But this, this feeling that we have towards pain, I can see in your analogy, and that I, I feel that is a big thing. A lot of us, we almost make the pain into something bigger than it is because we talk about it for so long and we're afraid of it for so long instead of just embracing humility 
in the moment and trusting God. Because see, when we engage with God in his process, he's going to bring us things to assist our humility, to help us feel all those emotions in a really timely manner. I feel a lot of us approach it in a self-reliant way. Right, I've got to be humble, I know I've got pain, I've got to feel that, I'm going to have to psych myself into this, I'm going to have to get to that point, right, I'm going to have to do it, instead of just saying, okay, that's scary, <laughs> I can even have a sense of the pain that's inside of me, that's scary, but I'm going to trust that God created me to do this, and that all of his laws are going to lead me to doing this, and I don't have to deal with it all in one go, I just have to be willing and as I'm more and more willing to be overwhelmed, it'll get easier and, and it'll just keep happening. When we're standing over here looking at the train wreck going, whoa, that's going to be intense. I don't know. I don't know if I can go there. Maybe I know I should go there. I should do that. I should do that. I'll pray about that. You know, it's almost like we're self-reliant in a process that's trying to teach us God-reliance. Yeah. Philippa? And if we go to Alexis, I'm not saying yeah. I feel like for myself, um, I only choose humility pretty much when I'm in usually physical pain, uh -huh. agony. And the rest of the time, um, I'm self-reliant. Yeah. And then it, it's like I have to create something so painful physically that then I choose the humility. Yeah. And that seems to have been my pattern and it's ramped up over the last little while in that you're creating more physical pain. oh more physical pain yeah, yeah. like yeah. pain like I've never experienced in my life before yeah. yeah 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 so it's about it's about generating longing as well isn't it I mean some of us it takes the in intense pain if you can embrace humility in the intense pain then you just have to like begin moving the scale backwards so <laughs> so I know I can embrace humility what do I have to wait for it to be totally painful it's about fear and then then there's that whole fear desire thing that Jesus has spoken to us about so many times how can I grow my desire for this yeah Fabio oh sorry Alexis then Fabio yeah. um Mary I, I was just waiting to possibly offer that the reality is <laughs> is that I get a feeling a lot of us came to this path out of addiction, not not out of some high ideal. Like, for instance, when I heard the first seminar, I wasn't going like, "Yeah, I want to totally love the world." <laughs> you know, was, that yeah. was not the case, actually. Yeah, it that's was, true. To like... me, it was like I had this addiction of like, "Oh, here's truth." Like, you know, like somebody speaking truth, and and if enough truth spoken around me, I won't get hurt. Yeah. And I just feel. That you know, like it's it's good to be real about that too. Um, eventually, I'm 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 feeling like oh wow, like loving, say you know I would say I'm at that point where I'm going oh loving God is going to be the only way. It's not true or whatever you know. But I feel like for myself, I'm evolving towards those ideals. I didn't come with that. That's yeah. that would be a lie for me. I think that's a good point to raise, yes. Alexis. I have a bit of a. I want to change, heal the world, save the world thing going on inside of me. And honestly, sometimes I still go, I'm going to Africa, I'm building a well, this is, I can't handle it anymore, this dealing with causes, dealing with causes is, I need to feel like I'm getting somewhere. Um, so perhaps I'm speaking there more from my own feeling of like, that's a big motivator for me but I do want to say to you guys unless there is some desire beyond avoiding personal pain you, there has to be some kind of noble desire within you that's going to lead you through this process otherwise you will get bogged down you have to be real about where you're at I agree and and trust the process that God has designed if I release these feelings then new feelings will be able to rise up in me that might be more noble but that that desire for something, for for God, for love of others, for love of yourself, these things are going to have to, if you're going to be at one with God, you're going to have to be led by those kinds of desires, yeah. Yeah. Fab, did you still want to say something? You're right. Okay. Okay. All right, let me...
Let me remember where I'm up to inside of myself. <laughs> um, what about this issue of longing desire, guys? How do you feel that's going for you? <laughs> in your head, not in your heart yet? Uh, Rita? Yeah, <clears throat> so longing and desire is not going good. I haven't found my desire. I'm, I am in too much fear. And I'm just discovering my fears very slowly. Yeah, okay. And also to the question before, when I started that path, I thought, oh, great, I finally have found the thing where I can help other people and it will make a difference and it all will be worth it. And I don't have... To, but the fact is, it's nothing about that. I have to look at myself. That's just the opposite of what I thought. Yes. Yeah. And this is, this is the, the thing I was alluding to before. The essence of the teaching is that if we're going to change anything, we must look at causes. And so if, if we want to change that, the world, we must look at the causes inside of ourselves for what is happening in the world. And right now we live in a Western country which means we are a part of an oppressing race. <laughs> we are a part of a group of people who take from the world from in, in the way that we live our lifestyle. And I'm saying that not to like guilt or shame you, but to say there are going to be emotions within us that we have to heal surrounding that if we want to change that. And they're, they're within us just by the nature of where we are and the way we live. Yeah. Teresa? Um, with the longing and desire, I've always wanted to know the truth and I've always, yeah, forever, been looking for it. Recently, I've just realised that how much of an addiction that was and how much of an avoidance it was because it was truth about everything else and truth about yeah, everything else except for myself. So, like, the external search for yeah. truth, yeah, to solve the mysteries, yeah, yeah. Eloisa? I'm noticing like what I thought was longing and desire was a real head um, thing and I was like, yeah, long and desire, I'm sure it's great. And what I'm noticing is all these things happen and I'm like, whoa, like, and especially good things and I'll be like, wow, something good happened. How did that happen? Because I'm not aware of having the desire for it to happen sometimes yep. and it's sort of like having to trace back. Um, and obviously there's something in me that creates that but it's almost like a whole new thing from going to head to heart. Yes. And yeah. it's quite confusing because I really like the head. <laughs> well, you've been taught, haven't you, that the head is the best... You should develop your brain and your intellect in order to mm. be a good person. Yeah. And so you miss all this desire stuff. Yeah. And, and especially, I suppose, the negative desires, like, you know, that we create exactly what we are, where we are. Yeah. And so I go, OK, all this stuff that I think is really bad is happening to me or has happened. So how did I... Like, what's my part in that? Yeah. And obviously that's still an intellectual thing. But every now and then something happens and I go, OK, I created that. But I can't find, like, the first bit of, you know, when it started. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're having to train your senses yeah. to, more towards what's happening in your heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's yeah. kind of full on. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose um, one of the things that I wanted to say, you, you mentioned earlier about choosing humility. With longing and desire, what is the key thing that you... F like, the thing that I see a lot of people missing about longing and desire, that Fabio has mastered... Is it taking action? Yes. Yes. So if we could say simply that we have to choose humility, we have to be willing to act with longing and desire, don't we? We have to be willing to act in harmony with what we want. And to take... Like, honestly, one of the things... Remember, my, the other side of the board is what I see happening. I see a lot of people, again, using their injuries to justify unloving behaviour in the guise of, oh, I'm just waiting to find my longing and desire. So I'm wait the government can support me or my partner can support me or someone else can support me while I find... Because it's, it's in harmony with God and my soul that I should find my longing and desire that's pure. But I'm saying you're never going to if you're avoiding an issue of love in that very act. You know, if you expect someone else to care for you physically while you 
find your longing and desire, you've missed another really important lesson of love. Can you guys see that? Yeah. And again, this is part of this cultural thing that I'm talking to you guys about, you know, challenging these. What does this really mean? It actually means acting. You can't sit around and find your longing and desire. Brida? At the back, Sarah. Um, that longing and desire is for me often happening, or the acting to get to the desire, find out, is often happening out of addiction. Or I act and afterwards I know it was another addiction. <laughs> so is that just the way to do it? <laughs> At least I act? Well, yeah, because... Or what should I do before? Well, <laughs> what, what's up? This bit. If you did that bit, it wouldn't... If you were humble, you wouldn't take an action in desire, uh, in addiction, would you? Yeah, but I'm not humble. And in the number five uh, talk with about humility, yes. AJ says, if you live in your fear, he said a few very potent sentences and that, oh my God, I'm not humble. I'm so far from it. Yeah. But remember, S I'm talking about these things because we can make different choices and we can take different actions. We don't have to expect ourselves to be perfect we're, because we can't, can we? We're, by engaging this process, we're saying, I'm not yet perfect, but I desire it. I want to go towards that. So, Rita, I, I feel there's an opportunity before you step into the action, during the action and after the action, to, to be humble and to learn and grow from the whole process. But... But the desire is within you, as we've spoken about, to see it, judge it, and beat yourself up about it. Then do it again, see it, judge it, beat yourself up. Do it again, see it. And, and as you can see, it doesn't ever change the action. And lots of us are in that boat, aren't we? Because we feel it's preferable to beat ourselves up than actually deal with the unloving issue that's caused us to be unloving to someone else, or ourselves, or the environment. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I listen to recording, it makes more sense. <laughs> I get it always afterwards. <laughs> cool. cool. Okay. Pete? Um, one of my observations is most people find happiness uncomfortable. So they get into a desire and they get really excited. And when you're in that state, then you're not going to complain about anything. You're not going to worry about anybody. You're just going to get in there. <laughs> and so you both, you're not in the addiction when you're in that space. And so for, I just noticed a lot of people find that really uncomfortable. Like to just be, be excited and happy and actionise it because when you do, then you break all these other parts. So it's like they get a little bit into desire and then they just block it out straight away yeah. because it makes them feel really uncomfortable. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, and this is part of humility. You know, this is why... I feel it's really important that we understand the full lesson of what is humility because it's not just feeling our grief. It's being humble to the experience that's happening around us and within us. So it's being humble to desire as well. Um, Fab did a beautiful interview with Jesus just the other day when he was talking about the feeling of being in your desire it can be really challenging. You know, you feel like, whoa, I've got all this emotion going through me. I feel really excited about this thing. And of course, because we've had experiences where those things have been squashed or we've been punished for it, there can be a fear associated as well. Yeah. So that's about hu this living humility and choosing humility. Laura? Yeah, um, I'm actually one of those people because I recently just realised that the o it feels overwhelming to have so much passion and it feels bodily, like I can really feel my body and it keeps me up at night. There's things that I want to get up and start doing. So I, I feel it could be a bit like it's, 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 it, it's desire but it feels a bit scary because it almost is like manic, like is, I want more time and I want to do more and, and I can't slow. And I look at Fab and he's sleeping and I go and I dance for an hour at 2.30 in the morning. Like, and it feels a bit scary. Like, is this normal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose you can look at your daughter. When she really wants to do something, does she just go and do it? Yeah, I guess the aliveness feels scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and lots of us are used to, by the time we reach adulthood, f feeling pretty like... Dead. Yeah. <laughs> controlled. Yeah. Controlled in all of our emotions, in all of our actions. Yeah. Yeah. Fab? Add something. You know how you're talking about the train wreck? Yes. I think that's awesome because the way I look at the train wreck is like I look at the train wreck and then I see a bus, a boulder, a river and a couple of things to get to the train wreck. You know, and you know that the, you listen to the divine love and you want to eventually get to the train wreck really if that's what you desire. But it's, you know, being able to first get a rope for the boulder and start climbing it and then making yourself a boat to get across the river. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And that's, des that's the desire part, I think. And yeah, actually. and it's almost you're now displaying another quality, hey, that comes when we exercise humility and desire and it becomes faith. You realise, oh, I'm engaging this desire in humility and it's working. And I know now if I just keep going in this process, God's not going to hit me with something that I can't handle. I can just keep going and it is a process. And I guess that's why, you know, we talked at the beginning and I said, I feel like a lot of you guys go, yes, this is it. And then you step into it and you get bogged down into this kind of process where all the joy is gone, all the inspiration is just blah. And that's actually not engaging the process. Engaging the process is far more interactive. You know, there's far more uh, feedback happening in your life. If you don't know how you're going, I suggest engaging with humility and taking action. You know, this is how, and it becomes far more rewarding and faith grows. But it does mean confronting fear. The, I can guarantee one of the biggest reasons we get bogged down is because we want to justify fear rather than feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that before I move on? Okay. Yep. Um, the, the way I understand humility... Oh, sorry. The way I understand humility... Um, like, uh, I just, I, for me, it kind of means uh, like sitting in my body. So it's a very bodily thing. So that's, that's kind of what you mean. As, uh, that's part of fear the one's, pa one's passions and desires and emotions, yeah? in that moment. That's basically what you're talking about, right? Well, yeah. no. <laughs> it's part of it. And yeah. this is what I feel like a, a, everyone wants to kind of know, wh like, what do you mean by humility? And, and as I said, um, 700 hours talking about it. But there needs to be a decision to make a choice to do it. Now, a lot of humility is, yes, feeling what you feel inside of yourself, but it's also about never avoiding what's being brought to you, embracing the experience that you're having at any moment. So, in, and, and not avoiding... Say I'm talking to Paul. Something happens with Paul and I feel confronted. Instead of putting down the shutters, it's be, remaining present with him, you know, and, f and remaining connected to myself through, in, through that process. So it's very much about connection with yourself, you're right. Yeah. But, it, but there's, a, there's a, an openness to humility yeah, that okay. I feel a lot of people are missing. Do you know what oh. I'm saying? Yeah. Like I oh. feel like a lot of people get caught up in, I've got to feel the grief, I've got to feel the sadness, I've got to feel the... When really, it's really a living process to be humble. And yes, it will involve grief and feeling fear and letting go of our rage. But... Um, I just feel it would be great if we can move away from this trend of talking about processing towards living humility. Because more of our processing will actually happen when we're, when we're living humbly. And when we try to do processing in self-reliance, it actually often helps us continue to live in fear. Do you see how that happens? Do you, because if I, if, I'm, if I come to a group like this and I just talk about uh, how the processing I've got to do and the fear, you know, and I've got to do all this stuff, a lot of that can be just avoiding being together, desiring to love each other in that interaction. So that's me avoiding the fear of being together and attempting to love. And I'm using the words of processing in avoidance, actually. I'm using the words of the path in avoidance of actually living. I feel like you don't quite get what I mean. No. no. You get it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Did you have anything else? Uh, no. Cool. Paul? 
I was just going to say for myself, it's sort of having the courage to be myself mm -hmm. instead of thinking, oh, I'm woman-pleasing or man-pleasing or different <laughs> stuff, but just to, you know, be out there a bit more and to, and to live and to have a go and like to act, really. Totally, Paul. Yeah, and then... And then we'll get the we'll get the feedback, hey? If we realise, oh wow, I just totally did that thing where where I pleased all the men in the room, then I've at least got the tangible feeling of it. If I know I've got the injury of pleasing the men and and I'm intellectually like forcing myself down a road where I don't see any men and I, do, I just am on the lookout all the time, <laughs> I'm actually trying to prevent an emotional experience, aren't I? And that's different to choosing emotionally to not please men anymore and feeling the fear of that. I feel a lot of us try to choose intellectually, modify our behaviour, and then we just end up back on the natural love path, don't we? I know it's challenging to really grasp humility on an emotional level, but I feel we can, it's good to engage these kind of discussions so that we can begin to see, ah, I'm missing it. This is not really humility here. There's this, there's this other state that I can expand into. And honestly, guys, when we all master humility, so much of the, the work is done. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're over halfway home <laughs> to God. Because once we're totally engaged in that process with him, it's, it's just going to fly like a beautiful dream, actually. It's just dealing with these fears that we have towards losing control, losing looking perfect, losing, you know, all, losing all those things that we have built up that make us feel safe and it's actually self-reliant. I think in, in one of the interviews that I had with Jesus were discussing humility, I said to him, oh, I had this realisation that every, what I thought was happy was actually feeling safe. <laughs> I don't feel happy. I've just been trying to feel safe. And that, does, that kind of feels like Laura said, a bit dead, like a bit half alive. Um, but I just, my whole, my whole life was so attuned to avoiding fear that that's when I felt the best, when I could be, outside, be away from fear and feel in control. But I'm realising now that it's not, not a really joyful place to be. Yeah. Dave? Uh, with longing and desire, I'm having trouble getting a handle on that. Like intellectually, I know, yes, I need to generate a longing, I need to generate a desire. But it, uh, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to be... I know this isn't, isn't right to say it, but it doesn't seem like it's in me or, or, or maybe it's just that I don't allow myself to feel those things. Yeah, Dave, I feel it's... If you just go back to the lessons of humility, you know, that there's, there's obviously feelings that you're avoiding and you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself intellectually to generate a desire rather than just being with yourself and feeling yourself because inside of yourself, honestly, the more I connect with myself, the more afraid I get because I go, oh my gosh, there's so many desires in here <laughs> that I've been, you know, I deal with a bit of fear and then there's this huge desire that comes out of me that scares me even more. Like talking to you guys, so I'm like, I can't do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> I just want to be afraid some more, you know. So I feel, if you, just speaking for yourself, you know that you've had this real fear around your desire for a long time and that's why you've looked to spirits to help, to give you guidance, which was actually to give you their desires rather than you having your own desire. So I feel, Dave, it is, it is about being really real with yourself emotionally rather than pressuring yourself intellectually to, to try to be a person in desire. Do you know what I mean? I'd start with, I'm a person who's terrified of desire. Okay, God, can you help me with that? Can you, you God, help me with that? To, to feel through that, to really understand why this is happening, why I feel this way, why I'm avoiding so many things. And then let God show you, ah, Dave, you just avoided something there. Ah, you just avoided something there, Dave. And start there. Start at your avoidances. Instead of avoiding, embrace them. See what happens. See what you feel. You might confront a fear. As you confront a fear, you might find, oh, there's a desire <laughs> I can choose to avoid it or embrace it. I'll embrace it. Oh, that, that was pretty emotional. I uncovered something there. But that's good. I can feel that. And oh, 
there's another desire. Usually I would avoid this desire, but I'm going to embrace it. And gradually, this, this beautiful relationship between humility and desire, as I'm more humble, I feel more desire. As I act on more desire, I have more opportunities to be more humble. This thing, this beautiful relationship between the two happens, and then you have the beautiful byproduct, which I talked to Fab about, which is faith. God, this works. I can do this. I'm changing. When we just intellectualise about both states or we make excuses about our fear of both states, because really what's preventing us just living in desire and being humble beings? It's just fear. And it's actually making excuses for our fear, justifying our fear. We can just choose not to justify it anymore and go, I know I'm afraid of that. I'm not going to justify me avoiding it anymore. I'm going to step towards it. Feels scary, feels out of control. I don't know if I'm going to do this perfectly, but I can choose to avoid or choose to take a step towards it. This has been the most powerful thing in terms of my growth. It, you know, it wasn't until I was willing to embrace some desire for teaching that I really dealt with so many fears that I've been sitting on for years. Now, you guys are going to have different desires to mine, and, and it, all it takes is just to take steps in the direction of them and involve God in that process. Humility, honestly, when you act, emotion comes. <laughs> a lot of, and a lot of us avoid acting because we don't want emotion. Yeah. yeah. Would you agree, those of you who've experimented with acting? Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? And often we engage in this action and we do it and we have this big experience and we grow and we think that's great and then we forget that that's how it all happened that we really ignited a desire and stepped towards something and we, and we sit stagnant again for, for some time until we remember again. Yeah. Susan? I find for myself that this, with desire, it has a similar feeling for me as fear because it's like on the right on the edge and there's this sense of excitement surging through me but yeah. it's a similar feeling to when I'm in fear and I find um, unless I go into that vulnerable emotional space I, I can't sort of um, grasp it somehow. Yeah, so we have to be soft to both experiences, don't we? Yeah. And recognise, I think the reality is for, for all of us as we do embrace desire, some fear will be triggered. Yeah, they seem to walk hand in hand somehow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it's like, which side of the fence, which hand am I going to take? <laughs> exactly. Do I listen to the desire or the fear? Yeah. If I listen to the desire, my fear is actually going to come out of me. If I listen to the yeah. fear, I'll shut down desire and live in the fear. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's a lovely analogy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the last... The last part I wanted to ask you guys about was about what do you feel God's vision for, the, for us and for the world is? If we want to embrace this relationship with God, what do you think God's vision is? Alexis? Um, that we... Um, hang on, I'm doing the mic for... Yeah, yeah I was just looking <laughs> for the mic, but you had it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, couple of the journalists have yeah, arrived here. Yeah, j- just... Um, a vision of of a highly individualized you know creation that's that's just so unique um and right now you know it's just kind of like wonder bread box houses and everything's so terribly boring actually and i just have this vision of just such a, a unique creation where so much is, is is allowed to be manifested so long as it's in love yeah so diversity is that what you mean like a diverse yeah like a creative Diversity, a, though. A creative yeah. environment, you're meaning? Like, looking around, it would be very... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, first, you know, lot in, of in arts or whatever. It just yep. it doesn't matter where it's coming so from. So, beauty, art. Yeah. Yep. What else? Anyone else? Yep, sorry, go ahead if you've got the microphone. Yep, yep. Uh, if we go to Eloisa. Thanks, Alexa. I just imagine the world being like 
full of love and excitement and I suppose I can't really imagine myself fully being like a child but like ch- a children's playground like yeah. in a wonderland and that's yeah. environmentally but as well with people like um, I don't know I think you'd just you'd hang out with people if you wanted to you said no qualms saying no if you didn't <laughs> want to and and you probably wouldn't even have to say no because you'd only attract those who truly desire to do this like you know, create with you, I suppose. Yeah, so so you're saying it's an environment based around desire. People yeah. are drawn together through desire. Yeah. And, and if they don't have common desire, then they're fine not being together. Yeah. So there's a lot of love and acceptance as well as desire. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. yep, I agree. Okay, who else? Rita? I think it's a bit like in the book Through the Mists, yeah. The spirit world, those beautiful places and the interactions between people. Yes. And the attitude towards the ones who are in need of help. Yes. Yeah. So so can you describe a little bit more for people who haven't read the book, Rita? What is the attitude towards people in need of help in that book? Um, it is totally without judgment mm-hmm. and totally... Uh, thinking about our Afrar and others thinking about thinking about them and helping without um, getting anything or without yes. addiction. Yep. Um, so it's it's there's altruism. Altruism, yeah. And love, yep. I have a picture in my mind but I can't describe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very beautiful, hey? Yeah. Altruism. Um, yeah. 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 Lovely. What else, guys? Yeah, Catherine? I just feel there's going to be a lot of gentleness, mm-hmm. um, not just in nature. So instead of we, us having these um, gully rakers when we have rain, etc., it's going to be lovely, gentle rain. And with people, there's, there's a lot of harshness, I find, between mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And I think there'll be a lot more gentleness with people. It's mm, nice, huh? Yeah. So between people, yeah. And the environment, yeah. Anyone else over here with Lenora? Yeah. A genuine sharing of mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. Sharing, yeah. Okay. Karina? Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Happiness for others um, to um, succeed and and have what they want. No jealousy or any competition or anything like that. So a desire that everyone... A, a loving desire for everyone around us and no sense of competition, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, if you pass back, yeah. I think as we... Um, learn how to trust and we completely entrust then we'll feel perfectly safe then to be completely free so a big sense of freedom to be how would we be yes because we've learned to trust so much that we could live in the moment and we don't even worry about what's going to uh, how we're going to support it you know we're we're perfect in trust completely so trust and would you say faith yes faith and and feeling that leads to a feeling of freedom safety Safety, sort of feeling that will be provided for. Yes, is that that's what you're right. saying as well? Yes. Yep. Yep. Shows my, my addictions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Shows my fear. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, Pam here, just on this side, Alexis. In the, yep. That we'd live in harmony with everything. You know, we'd be. Did you ever see the movie Avatar? How everything was in harmony. Yes. Yeah, when the. He climbed on the horse, he connected to it and there was this heartfelt harmony of everything. There's a feeling between plants, animals, the people all working in harmony. Yeah, yeah. I found it so sad in that movie Avatar how um, there was such this beautiful relationship between nature and the beings and, and then there was an attack and they chose to attack back and I thought, oh my goodness, would that really happen in a society that had learnt the benefits of, of um, feeling and working together? Ooh, I wanted to live there. <laughs> you wanted to live there, Pam, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. Pete? And Michael on this side, yeah. Uh, knowledge and learning would be free. Yes. And, and we'd embrace God's creations. Yeah. For example, what do you... Um, we'd embrace all the parts of what God has on the planet in front of us. So all the insects, the bugs, the creatures. Yep. We'd want to embrace it and want to understand how it all interacts with each other. We wouldn't resist it, avoid it, try to control it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, beautiful. And with the learning and the knowledge side of it, it would be a very different sort of knowledge and learning in the fact that it would be uh, whenever you desired to know something, you'd, you'd find those people there who would be willing to share it. So this protected, it would no longer be a protected or you have to pay to go to university or... Yeah, so all knowledge would be free and not owned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful. Uh, Michael, first. Yeah. A time when the emotions of humanity will become so beautiful and special that this would be reflected to the animal kingdom. Yes. And then the final result will be when the lion lies down with the lamb. Yeah. Yeah. Very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yvonne? Um, what I love that we've learned through the book group is about how Everybody's included. No one's forgotten. It's um, no matter what their condition is, yeah. someone is going to take care of that person. Someone's going to visit them and till the minute they're ready to wake and grow. And, yeah. and there's so much compassion and um, so much caring and so much patience. Yeah. You know, and you see them minister to someone and it doesn't matter what else there is. They're just present for as long as it takes. Yes. You know, yeah. whereas we're always, well, I, I um, have always been in a hurry to get through this to the next thing. Yes. And it, that's quite different. Yeah, yeah. Too, I feel. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I was just looking for the, um, the um, verse. Does anyone know which verse in Matthew it is about the shepherd and no one being left behind? Oh. It's a very beautiful verse. Um, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Hmm. That's uh, Matthew 17:12. 12 to 14, yeah. Yeah, so that expression of God's love for us, that he has for us, that's expressed in that, that parable, that it would be inherent in all of our attitudes to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Igor? Just a discovery overall, you know. We've got an eternal existence and there's so much, I feel, God have in store for us, you know. Once we master this level of love, I'm just looking forward, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> so the eternal growth There's and so discovery. Much to discover, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Discovery. Yeah. And I love that about Igor. He has this childlike quality about discovery. He didn't lose that thing. That, yeah. What can we find out? Yeah. Yeah. Kate. Um, I was just feeling about there will be a line. As a, as a as a group to greater goals, and it will be go, it will be God's um, purposes rather yes. than, you know, so many times today we're just controlled in our we want to control our own way, and we're invested in we've got to do it my way or the group has to listen to me or oh, I'm not being heard or all of that these personal fears and demands and expectations colour a lot of how we work together as groups on the planet at the moment, doesn't it? So this idea that everyone will be aligned to desiring to know God's goal. What does God want for, this pro for, the, for our environment? How would God want us to achieve this goal? Yeah, lovely. So let's put that alignment with. So it's a pretty awesome world, hey? <laughs> uh, Eloisa, yeah? Abundance. Just in everything, in every yep. way that you can even imagine, I reckon. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Yvonne, yeah? I'm so sorry. 
um, just further to what uh, Igor was saying, um, on, the, in the, on the world, or in the world, we look at um, learning as like a finite thing. Yes. It's like preschool, university, this degree, that degree, whatever. Whereas now I know this, I know yes. how to this. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and 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 um, I know for myself, I'm one of those people who's got really stuck in that place of I know. Mm -hmm. Whereas one of the things I've learned about humility is that it's about being open to discover everything, and no matter how much we've discovered, there's more. Yeah. Like it's actually not a finite process. This learning, it's infinite. Yes. And um, and I kind of feel that I'm only just learning to glimpse. God's magnificence in this and as much as whatever there is today, when we get there, there'll be more. Yeah. Like, it, 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 there is no end. It is just a journey. Yes. There's no end to that process. Yeah. Yeah. And, I love, and that's, that goes along with the pure abundance of that as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's lovely to imagine, isn't it? Yeah. What stands in the way of this happening? Mel, did you have your hand up? If you take the mic, yeah. Our own self, and a lot of the times that's fear. Yes, a lot of fear, hey? One of the statistics I found on the internet this morning was that in 2010, 5,500 asylum seekers arrived in Australia. That's 5.5% of all the seats in the MCG. And yet this is a major political issue in our, in our country, isn't it? There's so much uproar about this small amount of people who have no other place to go arriving. None of them have been terrorists or become terrorists, and yet it becomes a huge political issue. If we contrast that with the amount of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have been removed from their natural family, that number is 26,900 people. Is that even on the agenda of most? The assistance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have have a very obvious and documented history of being treated harshly in our country, do they even reach the political agenda anymore? They do in some small way, but not in the way that this issue of asylum seekers reaches it, does it? So that's the, that's the world we live in now, and this is the world that we want. We know this is possible. Oh, well, I know this is possible. <laughs> a lot of us really f feel that it can be possible, don't we? Yeah. But what stands in the way? Karina? As Mel said, it's a lot about our fear, isn't it? Um, our wrong use of will, free will. Yeah, we're using our will in a way to avoid our fear, to justify our addictions, to justify our lifestyle that we have, aren't we? And to ignore the issues of love with the people around us. This is why I wanted to be really frank with you guys about just what I observe in our... In our, in our groups here, you know, in, in the way that we meet. I've often come here and observed that many of you bring your own chairs. And lately I noticed the Lytton Hitchens are acquiring more chairs. But they're, because they're, they're, they're having to deal with um, your different chairs at different heights, it's quite hard to fill. Often it's hard to see you guys if we didn't have a stage. And... It's often struck me that no one has thought, why don't we just all chip in and buy a set of matching chairs? And yet many of you come every couple of weeks and bring your own chair and do all this thing. And, no one, and everyone's relying on the Lytton Hitchens family to not only provide this beautiful venue and to run heaps of things and give you loads of gifts, no one's ever thought, oh, we could do something here to make it more comfortable, more smooth in a lot of different ways. If we're, not do, if, we're not, if we're thinking we want God's vision for the earth and then we ignore really simple issues of love with each other, how's it going to happen, you know? And I know that's confronting. I brought you to this beautiful vision of how God's earth could be and now I'm confronting you with the issues of love that are really here. But this is what we have to do. We have to be willing to hold the dream and then go, okay, God, give me the truth of where I am right now because I'm going to have to deal with this if I'm going to reach this dream. And a lot of us then get cynical about the dream. We get disillusioned about the dream. We get angry about idealism 
And that's all because we don't want to just sit with the discomfort of how I'm not actually contributing in a positive way to that dream. We get angry at the dream and reject the dream instead of going, oh, no, that's possible. It just takes the, the right use of my will, the loving use of my will. Yeah. I wanted to leave you with two um, quotes. One is from the Bible and the other is from Through the Mists. And uh, keep in mind that there is some error, obviously, in the Bible and even in Through the Mists in terms of language, and we can talk about that perhaps afterwards. But I feel that the, um, the lesson and the sentiments hold very true. Okay, this is the parable of the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. Probably not going to happen. But anyway. <laughs> all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you the creation of the, since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of, one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. What's the meaning of that verse, do you think? I don't know that I've got all of it, but that we are, are all equal in God's eyes and any one of us is not more important than another. Um, God loves us all equally. Uh -huh. um, and I guess the story from that for me is I just get a feeling that God wants me to love everyone as my brother and sister. And wants me to love them all equally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you pass to Eloisa, and back to Rita, Sarah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, I feel it's about it's about love, and and why are we or me? Why do I choose selectively to love one person above another? And uh, um, you know, especially say some of the thing you know, visiting someone in prison or someone who's very sick or a stranger. Do I pander to my fear or do I actually genuinely reach out with my heart and say, I'd love to know you? Yeah. You know, and I feel like, I mean, God's doing that to each of us. And do I demonstrate that in my life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rita? Yeah. Uh, we have to stop being arrogant and just help the one who is right in front of us and not choose whom do I help and whom do I want help and whom, what do I get some, where do I get the most out of helping? Yeah, the addictive part of helping, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in the parable, he's, he's talking about judgment. He's saying there's a judgment day. Now, that's, that's not true, but there is a truth in that God does see our development in love. God does see how much we love each other. It's very hard to... If, if we want to love God and we know that God loves everyone, why would, why would we not want to love everyone? Why would we not love everyone as honouring the truth, as Yvonne pointed out, that we are all brothers and sisters and that we're all loved equally and that each of us has equal value? Now, the, the, I know that I'm talking about a lesson of love when we started talking about humility and desire. But really, I feel that unless we're aligned with this desire to love it will be hard for us to step through into humility and desire. Can you see that? And also, it's often the excuses we make about not being humble or not being in desire 
that end up leading us to a position that is not loving with the people around us. The whole reason that we talk about humility, desire, healing your soul damage, all of those things, is because we believe in a principle of love. Jesus and myself. We believe that it's the most powerful thing you can do with your life. It's the most powerful force that will affect the universe. It's the way you can connect with God, this, this way that we teach. And it is, it is as our very first comment, what is, this, what is this way about? And the lady said, it's about love. It's about love. And it is, it is really about love. There's many things about it and there's many 700 hours about it. <laughs> but it is really about forming this relationship with God based in love. And that love as you receive it will also lead you to, to be abundant in the love with those around you. But I guess I'm saying to you, you cannot grow in that relationship with God if you continually choose to ignore the opportunities to love those around you. Because you're working in opposition with him in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the, the last thing that I wanted to share with you is, is really beautiful, in my opinion. <laughs> um, this is from Through the Mist. And, uh, some of you have been participating in the book group about this and I've been really enjoying that. Um, uh, and this is from the chapter this, that we spoke about this week and I thought it was really fitting when I was thinking about doing this talk. So um, the main character in our book is called Fred at this stage and he's passed over, he's gone through the mists and he's on this journey of learning what happens when you pass and what are all, he's learning so many lessons about the nature of the spirit world and the nature of the soul and many lessons about love. And he comes to a point and he's with a friend, Kushna, who's in a much higher development than him. And he says, um, which of all the denominations or religions, if you will, contribute the highest percentage of the redeemed? So he's saying, like, out of all the religions on earth, how many people, like, come here and they're in a good space and they're saved? And Krishna says to him, we recognise but one religion here. That is love. And all its disciples have but one denomination. Lovers of mankind. No one of all the man made religions holds a monopoly of this attribute, but earnest and conscientious followers of it may be found in all. Its worship is service to humanity, its litany, noble deeds, its prayers, tears of sympathy, its sermons, simple lives, known and read of all men. Its songs are lullabies to soothe the broken hearted. Its Faith, the immolation of self, and its hope, heaven. This is the only religion which can write the passports of heaven for the pilgrims of earth. Systems of theology have no more charm for us here than they had on earth, but in every heart there is a latent ideal towards which all mankind blindly reach, is blindly reaching out, a vague and undefined hope to which all the nations are ignorantly aspiring a settlement of all political problems that is only just beyond the reach of statesmen, a method of internal arbitration by which peace shall reign on earth. These are all generating in the womb of futurity. Which is very beautiful, a sentiment, isn't it? But it basically says that it's our development in love. It's our development in love which causes us to grow, that we, that we would have a good life. And it is our service to other people that it often is demonstrating that love. And now that I've just told you all this stuff about serving other people, <laughs> do you think that I'm just giving you a sermon about how you should just go out and do stuff for other people and everything will be all good? No. <laughs> It is all based on these, these very core principles that we talk to you about all the time. They are all about... As um, I was talking to Fab this morning and he was saying about how since he's embraced his desire for music, he's suddenly found that he's meeting people who've never heard of the Divine Love Path, not even interested, but he's ending up having discussions with them about how their emotions are impacting on their happiness and he's, he's actually mentoring people who are wanting to grow in their confidence and grow as people all through, this, all through his desire for music. 
And that's because he embraced this magic partnership, humility, desire, humility, desire. And through that, through becoming our true selves, we automatically begin to serve. We automatically begin to serve those people around us when we, when we do that work within us. But, but these are the things that really impact, they create our soul condition, these choices that we make, whether we choose humility or we look at the train wreck off in the distance, whether we act in desire or we just talk about it, whether we grow inside of ourselves a desire to really love each other rather than justify our fears of each other. There's no question that stepping onto this path is going to mean challenging some fear. It happens almost immediately and probably continuously if we really embrace it for quite a while. But it is very rewarding if we bite that off. Remember at the beginning I was talking about how I feel like a lot of you went, yep, this is it, I'm going for it. And maybe every motivation wasn't, wasn't completely aligned with redeeming the world. Or, but, but something inside of you went, yeah, I want more love. Yeah, I want more truth. Yeah, I really want to understand who I am and what the soul is. Or yeah, I want God. And stepped into that and then sort of found it kind of got all a bit turgid and, oh, what is going on here? And nothing feels that good anymore. And actually now I'm afraid of these people. This is where we've fallen off the tracks of understanding the really basic principles, the beautiful principles that actually bring you reward. Sometimes we can watch all 700 hours on YouTube and miss that it just takes us choosing humility in every moment or in at least half the moments of the day and acting in desire when it, when it presents itself. That's when... That's when the 700 hours begin to step into context. You go, oh, that's what he was talking about. Oh, oh, now I get it. Or, oh, I've got to go back and watch that thing where he talked about that before because now I really feel like there's something that I've experienced that I can apply this to and maybe it'll deepen my understanding of it. But if we all just come together and, and just talk about these principles and never act on them, never really make a choice for them, we won't, that this thing that in both books talk about, this, this condition that we have as we live on earth and as we pass into the spirit world, it won't have changed in its condition of love. And, and in the end, that's what you desire, isn't it? You just told me this beautiful vision of how the world is going to be, how God desires the world to be. And that's really possible and it's simpler than you think. It just involves dealing with causes within ourselves. And that's not always easy. I understand that. But it is definitely doable. Anyway, guys, I'll leave you with that for today. Thank you very much for being my audience. I think you all need a song now. <laughs> It's, it's really always our pleasure to visit you guys down here, you know. But Jesus felt today that he's probably spoken enough and perhaps it is time for action. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs>